So hello, my name is Dirk Kruger and I'm so glad that you could join me today as I discuss my recent work, the fiscal and welfare effects of policy responses to the COVID-19 school closures. This is a uh, joint work uh, with a team of researchers that include Nicola Fuchs-Schindel, Andre Kurman, Etienne Lale, Alex Ludwig and Irina Popova. And let me motivate uh, the paper by showing you a map of the, of the United States. Uh, so what you see on this in this map displays it, it displays at the county level the change in visits to school between spring 2019 and spring 2020 using data from cell phones that we have acquired. The darker is the color. The larger was a was a decline in school visits. And what I want you to get away from this picture is that pretty much for the entire country. Uh, the reduction in school visits amounted to 75 to 100%, suggesting that for most countries, the colors in, the colors in, in red. Uh, schools were effectively closed from March to May 2020. And this decline, uh, this re this uh, decline in the school visits resulted in a massive loss in instructional time at the level of the schools. Uh, of course, the School closures were a part of a larger policy response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, almost immediately when uh, the economy was locked down, a large academic literature sprung up to analyzing the consequences of the economic lockdowns. In contrast, a much smaller literature looked at the short and then also the long run effect of school closures partially, and that's my conjecture because the main costs of the school closures accrue mainly in the long run. So what this paper tries to achieve is it tries to estimate, estimate the long run effects of school closure on the effect of school ch children, uh, specifically their average future earnings their welfare, but with a specific focus on the distribution of these effects, eventually on the public finances, because if children earn less income in the future, that will affect tax revenue. And at the end of the paper, we then investigate a hypothetical policy thought experiment where we keep the schools open in the summer of 2022 and 23 for six uh, weeks to see whether this policy intervention is a useful tool uh, to ameliorate some of the school schooling losses that COVID 19 brought, brought to us. How do we do this? Uh, we go in three steps. We first look at data from SafeGraph, which is cell phone data, and data from Burbio, which measures school closures, to estimate the effective loss in schooling time uh, in the period between 2020 and 21. Since at least the cell phone data are at the individual school level, we can do this separately by school type. Therefore, we can do it by public versus private schools, by elementary and secondary schools, and for schools in rich and poor counties. Then we take those measures of effective losses in schooling time and feed them into a life cycle model. That life cycle model has endogenous child human capital accumulation. Uh, so when a child is in school, it, humans, human, it accumulates human capital and the accumulation depends on schooling inputs as well as parental time and monetary investments. When the child becomes an adolescent and at age 16, it leaves the parental household and makes higher education decisions and the human capital accumulated as a child affects that higher education choice and it affects future earnings. The COVID-19 shock is a reduction in schooling time uh, for the affected children. It will affect, therefore, their education choice and future earnings. And the model is used to quantify these future earnings losses and the associated uh, welfare, welfare losses, including their distributions. And we will also employ that structural model uh, to do the policy experiments of keeping the schools open uh, in 2020, uh, 2022 and 23 during, during, during the summer. Uh, so let me show you uh, the highlights of our findings, starting with the data. So what I've plotted here is a histogram of uh, the changes in school visits. Zero means uh, zero change relative to the base period, which is 2019. The red histogram shows the change in school visits relative to 2019 in the period between March and May 2020. So this shows again what I showed you in the, in the first slide. There was a massive decline in school visits during the spring of 2020. Then if you fast forward to the fall of 2020, the distribution shifts 
uh, to the right. That's the blue. That's the blue line. Uh, it shows that we are nowhere near normal in the fall of 2020, but the uh, extent of school closures were not nearly as severe in uh, the fall as in the spring. And then going to uh, the spring of uh, 2021, situation is further normalized. But again, most of the school visit data locate uh, to the left of the zero line, suggesting there's still a depressed level of on uh, or in person learning uh, in the spring of 20. 2021. There's very substantial regional variation of what happened. This is the picture that I showed you in the introduction for the spring of 2020. And now I show you the same map for the fall of 2020. Lighter colors uh, show that on the county level, uh, schools were more open. So comparing these two figures, displays the fact that in the fall of 2020, more schools were open. The second observation I want to highlight is that there's very substantial regional heterogeneity in the extent to which this happened. At the coasts, schools were still substantially closed. Whereas in the south and the middle of the country, most schools had opened. Uh, for in-person learning in the fall of 20, 2020. And this is the variation that I will later exploit in my structural model by grouping uh, schools into different, different characteristics. Combining uh, our estimates of school visits with Burbio data on effective uh, school closures, we can then estimate what fraction of the total two school years between uh, the fall of 2019 and the spring of 2021 was a, a school open for uh, effective learning. And for all schools together, we estimate a number of about 60%. So 60% of the school time in those two school, two school year, the schools were open for in-person instruction. So 40% was lost due to COVID. And there's the assumption that any virtual learning format is ineffective in transmitting uh, human capital. We also in the paper do this with an alternative assumption where uh, online formats are uh, half as effective as in-person instruction. The second uh, uh, observations that I want to highlight from this, from this table, there's very substantial heterogeneity in the school types. If you compare elementary to secondary schools, secondary schools were closed much longer than elementary schools. The effect of schooling time in elementary schools was larger than in secondary schools. If you compare public to private schools, private schools were open more than public schools during the COVID uh, period. And if you group, schools by county with respect to their income and compare the top 20% income counties to the bottom 25% uh, income counties, you have the perhaps surprising observation that schools in low income counties tended to be open uh, more during the COVID periods than uh, schools that were located in high income counties. And this goes back to the previous picture uh, because there's systematic variation of where high and low income counties are located in the United States. In, st in states where uh, schooling closures were relatively lax, these tend to be states with low income counties. States where uh, school closures were relatively uh, severe, these are uh, states where high income counties tend to be located and that drives this variation in school closures by, by, by income. So this is our empirical findings. And this table that I've shown you here, this is the key input into our structural, into our structural model because it measures the loss of schooling due to the COVID uh, school closures. 40% on average, but the substantial heterogeneity by the type of schools that, that we, are, we are talking about. We then feed these measures of uh, loss in schooling into an economic model. In the economic model, there's two generations, a parental generation and a child generation. This is a partial equilibrium model, so we ignore our factor price adjustments. When a child is in school, uh, they are part of a household where the parents make all the decisions, and the key decisions is whether to send the kid to private or public school how much private resources and time to spend on the child, and therefore if the COVID shock hits, how much of that to compensate by private time and resource investments. And at the end, when the child leaves the household, how much inter vivos transfers to give the child for, for college. The child accumulates human capital while in school. 
depending on parental and schooling inputs. The COVID shock hits, that means a reduction in schooling inputs temporarily. And then based on what the child learned in school, the child, when it becomes its own household, makes a decision whether to complete high school and or whether to go to college. And the effect of COVID-19 school closures is that the child arrives at the age of 16 when it decides whether to complete high school and at the age of 18 when it decides whether to go to college with less human capital, less equipped to succeed in college and therefore with less earnings potential when it enters the labor market after the child has completed uh, the education decision. Now let me give you three slides with the key quantitative results from the structural model informed by the empirical observation on school closures. First, on aggregate, averaging over all schools or over all children that are currently in school and are affected by the school closures due to COVID, we predict that there's a decline in the net present value of your future earnings by close to 2% and a reduction in the child's welfare measured by consumption equivalent variation, meaning the uh, permanent reduction in consumption a child would be willing to tolerate in a no COVID world, to be equally well off as living through a COVID world, a reduction in total welfare by about 1%. So we view these as sizable numbers. The second thing that I want to highlight, there's very substantial heterogeneity by the type of uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the uh, of the parent of the child. If you talk about a child that goes to public schools, the earnings and the welfare losses are slightly larger than average. If your child goes to private school pre-COVID, the earnings losses and the welfare losses are more moderate, coming from the fact that I showed you in the data that private schools opened uh, more during COVID, were less closed during COVID. The second dimension of heterogeneity I want to highlight is the age dimension. So this measures the loss in the present discounted value of earnings and in welfare by the age of the child. And there's two important effects here. First, other things equal, the younger is the child, the larger are the earnings and welfare losses. That comes from the fact that human capital is accumulated based on past human capital. So if a child at age six never learns how to read and write, then at age 12, it will be less effective in analyzing Shakespeare. And therefore, other things equal, the welfare and the earnings losses are going to be more severe for younger children relative to older children. But then I also shown you in the data that secondary schools were closed for longer than primary schools. And that's why there's a structural break at the time when the child uh, goes from primary to secondary school, because secondary schools were closed for longer during COVID relative to the no COVID situation in primary, in primary school. The last source of heterogeneity that we highlight in the paper is uh, the difference in the income of the parent. If you think about a child at the bottom quartile of the income distribution of the parent versus the top, suppose that these children would see the same extent of school closures, then poor children are affected more strongly by the COVID school closures than rich children. This, has, this is coming from the fact that rich parents are more effective substituting schooling time with private resources. However, as I showed, showed you in the data, uh, schools in poorer counties tend to be open more. Schools in uh, richer counties tend to be uh, closed more during COVID time. And this differential effect of school closures closes the gap in the uh, welfare losses of school closures by about one third. So it is the case that poorer children suffer more from the school closures due to COVID. But the fact that at least when it comes to county level income data, uh, schools in poorer areas tended to be open more, that closes this gap by about one, by about one third comparing this gap to, to, this, to this gap. So there is a silver lining uh, for the poor children in poor counties because the schools during COVID years were open uh, more than those in the in the rich in the rich in the rich counties. Finally, let me talk for one minute about the thought experiment that we then do in the model, thinking about a national expansion of schooling, uh, which amounts to six weeks of extra schooling in the summer of 22 and 23. You can calculate 
based on the model, the net present value consequences from the schooling intervention. We estimate that per child, this costs about $1,400. And uh, net of that cost, the net present value consequences for a typical child is about $1,000. So the child is expected to earn about two and a half thousand dollars more when it's uh, entering the labor market because of this intervention. Fourteen hundred dollars is the cost of the intervention. So the net present value uh, for the average child is about a thousand dollars, and the welfare consequences for the average child are non-trivial at one fifth of one percent. In a way, in in a sense. The fact that these are positive consequences is to be expected because the welfare consequences do not capture the full cost of the intervention. From the perspective of the government, this reform would pay for itself in the sense that it costs you about $1,400 per child. But these child children, because of the intervention, will be higher earners in the future. Therefore, the government will uh, collect higher tax revenue from these children. And in net present value terms, this is a reform that's, uh, that's cost neutral, in fact, slightly cost, cost positive. The last thing I want to highlight is, suppose you can do this expansion only for a selected group of the population, because there's scarce resources in terms of teachers and perhaps building. Whom should you expand the schools to? That very much depends on your objective. If your goal is to maximize the positive welfare benefits, uh, of the children, then you should gear these expanded schooling times in the summer to the poorest children. If the objective of the government is instead to maximize the extra tax revenue that you generate from this experiment, then you should gear it to children from the uh, top income quartiles, coming from the fact that it's those children that are on average accumulating more human capital, they are higher earner and with a progressive tax system, which we model explicitly, these will be the higher taxpayers. So if your objective is to maximize the extra revenue from this intervention uh, coming uh, for, for, the, for the tax revenues for the government, then you would gear it towards the top quartile uh, students. So this again shows that this intervention is according to our estimates, the good things, but it has very significant distributional consequences depending on uh, who will be the beneficiary of that schooling, uh, schooling expansions. And that's all I have to say today. So thank you a lot for watching. And this is a paper that's available as an NBR working paper. Uh, so if you're interested in the full account of our research, you can find it on the NBR website as working paper 29398. Thank you.